We will be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Our title is He Will Complete It. So let's again come before our Father's throne in prayer. Father, once again, we come before you, laying our hearts before your throne, longing for your word to wash us clean. We know you have a word for each of us today, so open our hearts to receive it, to listen, to understand. Lord, to take these things to heart, and then, um, Lord, move us to make them real in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we are in Philippians chapter 1. We'll be covering verses 1 through 11. We're just going to jump right in. Verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's review a little bit about Paul and Timothy. Paul was a man called by God to take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. From his earliest years, even as a child, he was very bold for the Lord. You see, Paul was born a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was also a Pharisee. And that's the group of Jews who was known for its super strict adherence to the traditions of the Jewish law. And that's actually later in Philippians, in chapter 3. Before Paul believed in Jesus, he even went around with a letter from the high priest giving him permission to go to different cities persecuting uh, the church. And he did this by finding Christians, arresting them, and putting them in prison. And he thought he was doing all this for the Lord. That's how bold, how zealous he was. Timothy, he was called by God to learn from Paul and minister with him. So backtrack, I forgot to mention, Paul had a conversion experience. That's very important. <laughs> He was out persecuting the church, and he was on his way to Damascus, and Jesus stopped him, blinded him, said, why are you persecuting me? And then you can read about that. I believe it's uh, Acts 9. But through that experience, that is how God gave Paul his calling to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, it says Paul and Timothy. Timothy was called by God to learn from Paul and minister with him for the gospel, Paul met him on one of his missionary journeys at a city called Lystra. Timothy's mother was Jewish, but his father was Greek. You can read about that in Acts 16. Now, Timothy, he was strong in the faith, and he was very gifted for ministry. 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 5. And so um, what Paul did, Paul saw all this, of course. And so Paul asked around town. You know, he wanted his references. He checked him out. And uh, after he checked him out, this guy's the real deal. He, he lives what he preaches. So Paul invited him to join his ministry team. These are the guys writing to the Philippians. And they're writing as bond servants. And that's a very important word. It's going to actually come into play in the idea repeatedly throughout the book. They called themselves bond servants. It's a Greek word maybe you've heard, doulos. And it can be slave or servant, depending on the context. Now, we know that as Christians, we are voluntary life servants bound to the Lord. Lord means master. He is our master. We serve him with our lives. Now, when Jesus calls us to believe, he also invites us to let him be Lord in our lives. But here's the thing. He doesn't force that on anyone. Now, depending on who you are and what his plan is, like we saw recently with Jonah, um, he may arrange the circumstances so strongly that it uh, persuades you to fully surrender to his lordship. Um, Jonah, he, he did this with Moses. Uh, he did this with several different people in the Old Testament. But it was still a response, um, a voluntary response um, to the Lord. So I have an illustration. Uh, my daughter, Gabriella, is in the kids' room. She is super sweet. 
and usually she is very responsive to my instructions. But she is still her own person. And sometimes she needs that extra bit of persuasion to follow my instructions. I have to remind her that, you know, this is going to happen, but it can happen the easy way or, or the less, less enjoyable way. And that when we don't listen to instructions, there have to be consequences. So you can choose to comply, or there can be a loss of privileges and devices and so forth until what needs to happen does happen. It's as simple as that. But at the end of the day, she has to choose. And sometimes it just, uh, things don't happen because she chooses otherwise. Um, but you know, that is what God tells us as parents to do with our children, uh, to train them to follow Jesus. And that's because when they grow up, they're still relationally our kids, but when they grow up and when they're out of the house, they're out of our covering. They're on their own. So at least they know how to live with God first in their lives, but you know, when they're grown, it is up to them. And if they don't learn their lesson from mom and dad, then they'll get to learn it a harder way from the world. See, that's how God is with us as well. Except unlike earthly parents, because we're sinful, we're imperfect, we're finite. God isn't any of those things. He is that perfect parent. And he trains us and he sends us out as lights for his kingdom. Then when, you know, we make our choices and we can choose to do things his way or our own way. And then life gets hard and we get beat up and caught up in sin and, or whatever, you know, especially when we take our own path. And, but then he says, come on back. I'll pick you up. There may well be consequences. A lot of times there's consequences. But even through the consequences, I'm going to keep training you because I love you. And then when the time comes, I'm going to send you out again. Now, Paul and Timothy, they are writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus. All the saints in Philippi, no exceptions, leaders included. He makes a point to, to say that. Saints literally means holy ones, and it's referring to all the Christians. So the way I think of it is like this. When God looks at a believer, he sees us through the blood of Christ. See, Christ's blood atoned for our sins. It brings forgiveness and reconciliation with the Father. And this is what's sometimes called positional Holiness. It means that before the throne of God, our position with him, we are already saints. We are already made holy because he makes us holy. But now at the same time, on the day to day, we are growing in holiness as we see God first in our lives. And this is what's sometimes called practical holiness. The day to day grind. And that's where God is teaching us how to live out that holiness that he has already given us. Now, they are writing to all the saints in Philippi. The city of Philippi, it dates back to the 6th century. Um, if you have a map in your Bible, you can look now, or if you don't want to lose your page, you can look later. But it is around the area of Greece. You want to find the Aegean Sea. And uh, then Philippi is on the northern bank, about 10 miles inland from the port of Neapolis. It was known for rich gold deposits. So what came to my mind was like San Francisco in the gold rush. It was settled actually by, um, well, it was already a city, but it was settled after a major Roman war. And it was settled by military veterans who then uh, dug into those rich resources. Um that battle, that's Mark Antony and Octavian. Maybe you know who they are. Octavian, later Augustus Caesar. So very famous uh, people. This is the city where they defeated the men who assassinated Julius Caesar. So that's what's so significant about the city historically. But for Paul, this was the first church he planted in what's modern day Europe. The old word is Macedonia. And so you can read all about that again in Acts 16. Now, Paul is writing to all the saints with the bishops and deacons. 
Those are kind of old church words. They're fine. It's a decent translation. It's just we don't use those words uh, in a lot of churches anymore. Bishops, that, um, that word is the word overseer. So it's the position of overseers in a church. That's especially the pastors and then also the head ministry leaders, to put it in modern language. Deacons, that literally means servants. These are the members of the local congregation who do also hold positions of ministry. Your Sunday school teachers, your hospitality team, your prayer team, tech team, visitation team, worship team, the ushers, and so forth. These are all your uh, everyday ministry servants. If you want to look more into those issues, you can check out 1 Timothy 3. But Paul is writing to all these people in the church. Everyone, no exceptions, no exclusions, everybody. And he, and he writes to them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are common words, but they are commonly misunderstood. Grace. That's when you give a blessing or a gift to someone who doesn't deserve it. They haven't earned it. Grace is an undeserved gift, but even gifts must be received. And then after we receive the grace of God, we also gain peace with him. Now, we're going to go into a little theology for a moment. It's important to understand that before we believe in Jesus, we are actually enemies at war with God. Yes, we like to talk about how we are wayward sinners whom the Father dearly loves. That's the part we all like to hear, right? The little sheep that's lost. That's fine. That's not wrong. That, that's correct. But the part we don't like to talk about so much is how our unbelief makes us actual enemies of God living in rebellion against him. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says, You who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. God was not willing that we should die in our sins without any options. So he took action. Mm -hmm. Romans 5.10 explains, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Mm -hmm. And much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. But as enemies, he still extends grace to us, that free gift of salvation by faith through Christ. And when we receive that gift, then we are now at peace with God. As Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Have you ever wondered why as a believer and you're resting in the Lord and you, you're trying to walk with the Lord, all of a sudden you go out into your workplace or you go out into this, this place of hobby or you just go to the store and it feels like you're being attacked, spiritually speaking. This person is just so wildly rude or, or whatever. Well, it's a spiritual war. And if they are not a believer, they are enemies of God, which means if you're on God's side, they're an enemy of you. Now, that doesn't mean you are an enemy to them. That means that God is saying, they still need my grace. You show them. You be that light. So, grace and peace, they work together. Grace offers us salvation and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. And when we receive it, in turn, he says, now go, extend that grace so others can receive that same reconciliation. And then we can all have peace with God. That is the application, extending grace and peace to others as well. That moves us into verse 3. So that was the greeting portion. Some good review for those of us who have uh, maybe been walking with the Lord for a while, and then a little good intro for those of us who are uh, newer in our faith. Moving into verse 3, Paul typically begins his letters with prayer. 
So verses three to five, they say, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all the joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to go with some key words, some key phrases. Every remembrance. Paul was very fond of the Philippians. Now, he was only there a short time. And this is where um, they were walking down the road, and there was a, a slave girl who was possessed. And she was just saying, these men are for Jesus, and just yelling it everywhere they went. And Paul basically got annoyed and cast the demon out. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, the thing is, she was a slave girl, which means she had masters, and they were profiting off her prophecies. And when Paul cast the demon out, there went their prophet. They got angry because Paul had just hit their pocketbooks. So they had Paul and Silas tossed in prison. Now, he was only there a short time. And I'm going to read what the Lord wrote last night. And the church he planted was small in number, but it was mighty in faith and heart. Now, whenever Paul went to a new city, he usually went to the synagogue first and would share the gospel with the Jewish community. But Philippi was different. Acts 16.13 tells us, On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. Why didn't he go to the synagogue? Probably because there wasn't one. Now, Jewish Priests writing a little bit later, they tell us that in order for there to have been a synagogue, there had to be at least 10 Jewish men in the city. And so this is, picture this, this is a big Roman commercial trade city. It's lying along their, it's called the Ignatian Way. It's their, their major trade route, route going eastward. And there aren't even 10 Jewish men in this city. And so they go to the riverside and find women praying and worshiping the Lord there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. The Jewish community there was very small. And this is uh, at the riverside. This is where he met the woman named Lydia. She and her household... Uh, were the first to believe and become baptized. And this was the beginning of the Philippian church. Now, Paul says, always in every prayer, Paul and his team, they were people of prayer. Jesus was also a man of prayer. God wants his people to be a people of prayer because prayer is the lifeblood of our Christian faith. Prayer is how we connect with our Father who loves us. It's how we connect with our Savior who intercedes with us, for us. And it's how we connect with the Holy Spirit who guides us and comforts us in our daily walk. So take, for example, Matthew 6. We, we just talked about that a few weeks ago in the men's group. When Jesus is talking, uh, teaching the disciples about prayer, before he gives, let me start over. When Jesus is teaching the disciples about prayer, before he gives them the model prayer. He says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. When you pray. Jesus did not say if you pray, as if it's an option. He said when you pray, as if this is something that is naturally going to begin to happen. You could say it's a command. You could say it's an expectation. But don't you want to sit in the presence of your Father who loves you? That should come naturally as part of that relationship with him. But when should we pray? That's a great question. Uh, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, it's only two Greek words. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 answers this question. It says, pray without ceasing. Or you could say, pray unceasingly. Two English words as well. Now, here's the thing. This does not mean when you're driving down the freeway at 70 miles per hour, God wants you to close your eyes, bow your head, <laughs> clasp your hands in your lap, and let Jesus take the wheel. 
It also does not mean when you're performing heart surgery that God wants you to lift your eyes and raise your hands to the heavens and let Jesus heal the patient's heart. Okay, that's ridiculous. This verse is talking about a spirit of prayerfulness in your heart and mind where you keep an openness to the presence of God. It's an open channel of communication. It's basically like having your cell phone on in your pocket all day long and Jesus is on the other line. Like, you're not getting it out and saying, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, but it's, it's there in your pocket. And on a moment's notice, hey, Jesus, I need help. Or, hey, Jesus, that was awesome. Just that open channel of communication. That'd be weird. Maybe you got your one earbud in. That's, that's more normal, right? We see that every day. Instead of yelling at your pocket. Um, anyway. In your heart and mind, keeping an openness to the presence of God. Saying short prayers of joy. Or thanksgiving, I I do that. Thank you, Lord. Casting your cares to Jesus, Lord, help me. Fleeing temptation, oh, Lord, help me. (laughs) I mean, that's all prayer. And that's that open channel of communication. Now, when Paul is praying, he's making requests for the Philippians. Paul did pray for himself, but not just for himself. He prayed for other people. He prayed specific things for the people he ministered to. Fancy word, this is called intercessory prayer. It just means praying for other people. And it is one of the great privileges that God grants us as his children to be able to come before his throne on behalf of somebody else, another believer, another child of God, a brother and sister in the household of Christ, or an unbeliever who doesn't yet know God or is not, isn't yet a member of the family of Christ. Uh, Paul didn't just pray generic prayers. He prayed about real issues going on in the Philippians' lives. But that requires us to be open and honest, vulnerable with one another. Now, being vulnerable is very difficult. People are people. What I mean by that is they judge, they criticize, they gossip. Those are normal, everyday people having normal, everyday conversations that we hear everywhere in the world. But as Christians, God calls us out from the world, and he tells us not to do that, especially with one another. Instead, God tells us to pray for each other, to build each other up, to encourage each other in the faith. And I did not want to write this or say this, but I have to, because the Lord won't let me skip it. I have to ask some hard questions that nobody wants to hear. Please don't answer out loud, but I do want to invite you to answer to God in your heart. Have you judged a brother or sister this week? Have you criticized anyone this week? Have you gossiped about anyone this week? Now, If you have, first, you're human. But also, that is sin. So I just want to invite you to take a moment right now to agree with God, to repent, and then to pray a prayer of blessing on that person. And then also, if you spoke those things out loud to that person, of course, pray about this as the Lord leads, but go to that person this week and apologize. Don't defend yourself. Don't offer excuses. Admit you're wrong. Apologize and ask for forgiveness. And maybe they'll forgive you, maybe not. It's hard and it hurts, but that's the real, uh, that's real vulnerability. And that's the way God wants us to, uh, to interact with one another. Why? Because that's fellowship. Paul is praying in verse 5 for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. We already mentioned that Philippians was a very small Jewish community. Philippi was a very Roman city on the major trade route that headed east from Rome, again called the Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way. Not all Romans despised all Jews, but Romans also weren't known to be very tolerant toward Jews. In Philippi, with such a very small Jewish community, it would have been very easy to ostracize this small group, especially because they didn't participate in the pagan rituals or worship the other gods. 
And later in the letter, you read that the Philippians faced regular persecution. For example, uh, chapter 1, verse 29 says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, sometimes I gloss over things like that in the scriptures because it's easy for me to read that suffering for Christ is a privilege. I'm like, yeah, let's go suffer for Jesus. But then I take a moment to sit and think about, I'm like, no, I don't want to suffer for anybody. I don't even want to suffer for Jesus. Living out that suffering does not feel like a privilege. It feels painful. It feels disheartening. And that is why it's so important to hide God's word in our hearts. Um, Hiding God's word in our hearts is vital to our faith walk. Take, for example, if you're going through a severe time of trial, discouragement, whatever you want to call it, James 1, 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I don't want more patience, Lord. Okay, that's not the goal. Patience needs to have its work in you so you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do I have to, Lord? Yes, because I'm going to make you perfect. That's what Jesus is saying to you. Verses like these remind us that God is in control, that he loves us, that he's molding us to make us more like Jesus, and that he's using us to share his kingdom with the lost world. Which brings us to a, one of the many popular verses in Philippians. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work of salvation in me will complete it in me until the day Christ calls me home. Not quite. Um, not wrong, but not quite. Um, the verse is quoted for all kinds of reasons. It's a wonderful verse, super encouraging. But in context, the Philippians were a small church facing persecution. Paul is speaking truth into their trials as a fellowship, mm. hope into their heartache as a household of God, mm. and assurance into their suffering for him. Mm. Praying for others is important. And sometimes so is telling them that you're praying for them. They need that encouragement. Other times it's important to tell others what you're praying for them, as Paul is doing here. And still other times you pray it with them and over them. There is something very special about being present and praying with someone through the hard times. Because you never know when that moment of prayer might just be what that person needs to keep them from succumbing to whatever the trial is. So I tried humorlessly to make a point earlier that we apply this verse personally. And in terms of application, that is totally fine to be encouraged by God's word. Absolutely fine. Um, it's just that we want to make sure we get the meaning as well. And starting here, he who begun a good work in you, the you is plural. It's not referring to personal salvation so much as it is to corporate fellowship. See, the very real challenges of outside persecution and internal disunity you read about that in chapter four. They're like some people arguing over some stuff. Not going there right now. Um, but these challenges were threatening to tear apart this very small church plant. But here's the thing. If God wills a local congregation to continue in fellowship, God will sustain that fellowship yes, yes. through all the hard times. He will strengthen its core believers through the hardship to come out even stronger and more unified than before. And that brings us to verse 7. Paul says, it is right for me to think this of you all. There's the you all. He's talking to all of them, the fellowship. Paul spoke of his confidence in verse 6 in the church. In verse 7, he says it's right for him to think this way. He's not just defending the correctness of his confidence. He's explaining that the thanksgiving and joy he expressed in verses 3 and 4, that is the right way, the proper way to think about this small congregation where he ministered. Um, that is the right way, the proper way to think about 
your church family. You see, God didn't create the church to be a country club where we go to enjoy a shared hobby for a couple hours on Sunday morning. There's nothing wrong with enjoying shared hobbies, okay? But that's not the point of church. He didn't create the church to be a political platform for aspiring politicians, although it is absolutely proper to speak God's word to current issues happening in our world when done with the right heart and manner. God created the church as a household where he makes sinners and his saints and trains them to share his kingdom with the world. Engaging the world means our careers and our hobbies become our mission fields for sharing Christ. Engaging the world means politics becomes a platform for preaching Christ and living our faith before a world who desperately needs a savior. Engaging the world means suffering as the Lord wills that our chains and wounds might reflect his glory. And engaging the world means partnering with other believers from other backgrounds with different everyday beliefs even in united efforts to reach diverse communities and bring the gospel to the nations. And then this phrase, partakers with me of grace. This partnership is one of the reasons why the Philippian church was so dear to Paul's heart. In his time of need, this super small church showed up in a big way. So you see, Paul is writing from prison. And just a couple of verses later, verses 12 and 13, Paul says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. What things? It has become evident to the whole palace guard. Wait, he's with the palace guard. Why? And to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul is in prison surrounded by the palace guard. Sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. <laughs> now, there's a little bit of debate as to whether Paul is writing from prison in Rome or maybe Ephesus, Ephesus or maybe somewhere else. Most scholars say Rome. Paul doesn't mention it, so it's not a primary issue, so I'm not going to get hung up on it. Uh, However, it's clear that the Philippian church, though small, has provided quite generously for Paul's needs. How does that impact us? Well, partnering with other believers in ministry is another privilege that God gives us. It's interesting. When it comes to believers, God gifts us in so many different and complementary ways. To some, he gives wealth and resources. To others, he gives vision and leadership. Still others, he gives knowledge and skillfulness. Others, he blesses with time and willingness. Mm -hmm. And some he blesses as prayer warriors. And a lot of these, he doesn't bless the same people with all of these, which means we have to work together. He does that on purpose. He doesn't call anyone to do all the work. He calls us to work together in unity through the Spirit to do the work of ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 speaks to this. He gave, uh, he himself uh, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? So they can do all the work of ministry. No, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, Amen. for the edifying of the body of Christ, till all come to the unity of the faith, all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect, complete, whole man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God calls us to be partakers, not nitpickers, co-laborers, not conspirators, to work together to build God's kingdom, not to build our own towers and shoot each other down. So Paul longs to see this dear church. How greatly I long for you all. Notice how in both verses 7 and 8, Paul says, you all. Remember, Paul is still talking to the whole church not just individual Christians. Again, personal, application, totally, 100% correct. But in meaning, Paul longs for the Philippians with the affection of Christ. He is not embarrassed at all to call them friends. He strongly loves them. They are very dear to his heart. Now, that word longing, it's kind of a neat word. Um, It only occurs nine times. And I say that because it kind of illustrates what longing means. Um, Six of these times, it's about being with people, loved ones. The other three, longing to have our heavenly bodies. Boy, Lord, do I long for that. My body is a mess. Um, Longing of the Holy Spirit within us, that's James 4, 
that's a good one to dig into for for another study. And then longing for God's word as a babe longs for milk. By application, you know, when most of the world, I'm going to make it real here. When most of the world shut down back in March, most everyone I know was willing to do anything necessary for a few weeks to see the situation improve. Here's the thing. When weeks turned into months, personally, I knew in my heart, and some of y'all could probably see it, that I couldn't not keep meeting. I couldn't keep not meeting. Um, God created people to live in community and to engage in real life interactions. God even tells us that in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, here's the thing. They didn't have Zoom. They didn't have phones. If you wanted to be together with someone 2,000 years ago, you had to walk to their house to be with them or to a place to be together with them. Don't forsake the assembling, but exhort one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it is okay to to put that on hold for a time if there's, you know, a massive health crisis. But when we're talking about months and even longer, you know, at at that point, we're denying what God made us to do, which is live in community. And even recent studies and polls are speaking to this issue now. A poll reported by BBC News just four days ago says that the pre-pandemic levels of people in Britain who are almost or always lonely was about 5%. But at the start of this month, of this year, November 2020, that number is now 8%. That's the highest it's ever been. Now, 8% doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 4.2 million people in Britain who are almost or always lonely right now. Up from like 2.6 million. Almost, not quite, but almost double. That's a lot of almost or lonely people. Because In our legitimate and well-meaning efforts to curb one pandemic, we've created an entirely different one. Mm. And that's part of the problem, is people were created for community. And as believers, our community is the church. So if you are a Christian and if you are not in fellowship, I know you've got a longing in your heart. And that longing is in part to be in community with other believers. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or... I want to be in fellowship. See, I've met a lot of Christians, especially growing up, who say they don't desire to be in church or they have the reasons for not going to church. And I know people who don't go to church, they have their reasons, right? But deep, deep down, you can see that emptiness. Maybe you know that emptiness. Um, So so get up and find that fellowship that your heart is desperately longing for. Um, Pray about it. Of course, right now, there's some tricky situations. We want to be um, respectful of, of, you know, the situations that are going on in our world and responsible. But still, you know, we need fellowship. I'm not going to say that. Um, if, uh, If so, you know, if there's someone you know that desperately needs fellowship, pray that God would draw them into fellowship and then invite them to church. Um, that brings us to verse 9. And this will be our last section, verses 9 to 11. I didn't read verses 7 and 8. Let's read 7 through 11. Um, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my chains and in the defense of in confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ. There's the longing. Verse 9, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This I pray. We've already talked about that God desires us to be people of prayer. We've already mentioned the privilege of intercessory prayer. Here Paul demonstrates that privilege, praying the Philippians to increase in love, knowledge, and discernment. 
This is agape love, God's selfless, sacrificial, unfailing love. God demonstrated it by sending Jesus to die for our sins on the cross. When we, when we receive that love, God expects us to extend that same love toward others, even those who don't share our faith and convictions, and especially toward those who do. Uh, knowledge. In ancient Greek, there were four different kinds of knowledge. Uh, this kind of knowledge is experiential. Paul explains what experiences he's praying for the Philippians in verses 10 and 11. Discernment. So, so we'll, we'll talk about those when we get there, verses 10 and 11. Um, so put that thought on hold, what kinds of knowledge. And then discernment, this is perception with the mind. It means being sensitive to the spiritual or moral reality behind what's going on. Especially in the midst of trials and suffering, being sensitive to the leading of the Spirit and the direction that God is moving can be incredibly encouraging. Right, so, so what are these experiences of knowledge? What is it that, that Paul wants to, us to be able to discern? What knowledge he wants us to apply? Well, approve the things that are excellent. Things that are excellent means the things that are best or most valuable. Paul is praying that the Philippians grow in love, that they may be able to recognize whatever words or actions are most loving in a giving situation. That's not an easy thing. A lot of times it's difficult to determine which of the many good options in the moment is the best one? And this is where prayer and the word tip the scales. There's usually the rational way, the risky way, and the radical way. The rational way, that's the safe way. That's the planned way. It's not always the bad way. Sometimes God works that way. There's the risky way. That's the uh, big chance of gains or losses. You know, no risk, no reward, that kind of idea. Take the risk. Take the plunge. Um, I would say typically that's probably unwise. But at the same time, if God tells you to take the plunge, then you follow God and not, uh, not your own wisdom. Then there's the third way, which I just called the radical way because it's three R's and it sounds good. Um, <laughs> God often works through what I call the radical way. It's the way we don't see coming. Why? Because his ways are bigger than our ways. We don't see it coming, but he does because he wants us to trust him to get us there. God often works through the radical, not because it's safe or because it's wise, but because it gives the greatest opportunity for us to grow and for God's glory to be manifest in our lives. He also prays that they may be sincere and without offense. Now, sincere means pure of mind, that my motives are pure, free from error, free from falsehood. I am not giving in to the empty philosophies of the world, but I am letting the word cleanse my mind. Without offense means blameless and upstanding. It's not sinless, but it does mean having a clear conscience before God. And so when we combine those, there's the sincerity of mind, the purity of mind, and then there's the outworking of that in how we, how we uh, handle that in our daily life, in our words, in our actions. And again, you won't be sinless in that, but you are, the intent of your heart is to follow God and to treat others the way he treats us with that same grace peace, love. Uh, together, Paul is praying the Philippians may have their minds freed from worldly philosophies or lies they believed as they live with their hearts freed from the evil intents of sin. Amen. And now coming to verse 11, Paul also prays that the Philippians may be filled with the fruits of righteousness Paul does not here identify what these fruits are. My mind immediately goes to the fruit of the Spirit, but that is a singular fruit in many manifestations, and that is also of the Spirit. And here, these are the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So that makes me think there's maybe a distinction. But again, I don't, I don't know what fruits we're talking about. But I do know they are fruits of righteousness. So they do seem to refer to outward expressions of the inward transformation, the good works and the good words that flow freely from a heart yielded to the fountain of living water, the indwelling spirit. These fruits come by or through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Illustration. God doesn't just want us to have these fruits. Like I got a little, little dangly thing of a good word hanging over here. Got a little good word hanging over here. 
right? He wants us to be filled with them. So he like he, he wants me to have a lot of branches and all my branches having these big, juicy fruits of good works and good words. Um, this idea of filling means filling to the brim, filling to overflowing, filling to be complete or perfected. Maybe this is why the Philippians were facing so much persecution because as we've already read James 1, 2 to 4, those trials bring patience which leads to perfection, completion. Persecution for the Philippians was the means by which God was filling the Philippians with fruits of righteousness to overflowing. When Paul started his prayer in verse 3, he started with thanksgiving. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. One of the things I'm thankful for this year, you know, Thanksgiving's on Thursday, um, I'm thankful for a church that is small in number, but mighty in faith and heart. A church that has challenged me to learn and grow in many ways, always sharing with my family every blessing and challenge um, and encouragement to grow. So thank you, Perfect Love, for sharing with me in fellowship and in ministry. Uh, God has so richly blessed us. And I am confident that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of our Lord's return. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we, we just want to take a moment and, and claim that verse for ourselves, to apply it in our hearts, to understand that, you know what, it, it seems that our numbers have dwindled a little bit, and that can be discouraging, but we know from that verse that you will be faithful to complete whatever that means to perfect to grow yes lord to produce fruits of righteousness thank you lord that you might send us out and reach this community through us and we thank you for that privilege we thank you for that responsibility of course part of us doesn't want to do it so lord take that part of us away Mold us, make us, help us yield, and just give us hearts motivated, uh, passionately serving you and sharing you with the world. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.